and for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Pete Lumbus. You can virtually harass me, and I won't see it at TAC, uh, sorry, not TAC anymore, Pete CCDE on Twitter. Uh, I work at Cumulus Networks. Uh, I'm a technical marketing engineer these days. Uh, I like to say I do everything but write code for the most part. Uh, and what I want to talk about today, you know, here with Mellanox, here with Ixia, is, is where Cumulus fits into this model and kind of how we see what these two organizations are doing, how they mesh with what we do, and, and who we are and what we do, and then show you some of this stuff uh, in a little demo. So for those of you that don't know, what we are is we're the, oper we're the network operating system sitting on top of the switch. So I take a Mellanox switch, and on top of that switch, right, this gives me my, my ASIC in here. From Mellanox, that's the Spectrum ASIC. Yes, and we are the software Thank you. running directly on that bare metal switch. So we're not a VM, we're not an application on the side. We are an operating system running directly on that switch, writing device drivers, spinning the fans, flashing the lights, programming the ASIC. So although we are a software company, we have super deep knowledge of both the hardware and the platform, the optics, and the ASIC itself. And so I think it's one of the most important things is, is we are a software company that really, really understands the hardware very well. One of the things that's super cool about Cumulus Linux is we are just Linux. We are just a Debian Linux distribution. So we've, we've added some patches, we've made some modifications, everything that we've done that we are allowed to open source and send upstream, we send upstream. So one of the perfect examples of this is VRFs. So VRFs didn't exist in Linux a couple of years back. Uh, and we looked at some of the options that existed in Linux to do this. Some people are familiar with network namespaces. And we looked at network namespaces and we're like, this isn't the way that you should do routing table isolation. You know, it doesn't work. So what we did is instead of just building a VRF and doing it ourselves and forever and ever it will be the Cumulus VRF solution. Before we wrote a line of code in Cumulus Linux, we went to the Linux networking community and we said, hey, we think that we want to do something that's not network namespaces. It's called a VRF. It's pretty common in the network world and it's totally foreign to the server world. And this is how we think you should do it. And here's the code that enables VRFs on Linux. And through that open source process, we got our standard or our proposal accepted. They took our code and our VRF patches are now part of the Linux kernel. At that point, we went and implemented it on our switch. So the way that you configure a VRF on Cumulus Linux is exactly the way that you configure a VRF on a Linux device. The way that you configure interfaces on Cumulus Linux is exactly the same as you configure it on a Linux device. But what's really cool about what we're doing is we look at how do I build systems, data centers, architectures, networks, using simple building blocks, taking those Lego pieces and turning it into a Saturn V. And so I can take Linux as a building block and I can take an application on top, like free range routing, the open source routing suite that we use, which was a fork of Quagga. This is where the eVPN functionality lives, is within free range routing. It's the part doing BGP, speaking eVPN to everybody else, doing the interoperability. And I can take something like free range routing, number one, I can open source it, send it upstream, I can run it on servers now, I can have my servers doing BGP to my top of rack switch. We support something called BGP unnumbered, so I don't even have to put IPs on the links. So I can have my servers doing BGP peering to two or three top of rack switches. If I think about like an NVMe scenario we were talking about earlier, I might want more than two top of rack switches to really maximize bandwidth and scale out. Well, I could connect to four top of rack switches without using an M lag or a lag in that scenario. But we can take something like free range routing or whatever, again, those simple building blocks are, and we can put more building blocks on top of it. So we've created a CLI called Network Command Line Utility, and June showed some of that off. So for folks coming from the Linux world, they know IP link, IP show. They're familiar with those Linux commands, but for network engineers like myself, you're, coming, you're not coming from that world. Those things are, 
are hard to understand, foreign, some of the, the documentation isn't exactly great. Uh, and then you go looking for it, and you're like, hey, how do I do something? I can't find information. And the answer is RTFM. And you're like, but the, 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 the M is terrible. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> can't read it if it's bad. So we created something called Network Command Line Utility. And what the Network Command Line Utility does is it gives me a CLI, another simple building block, on top. And if you look at some of the other vendors out there that are doing Linux E things and their CLIs, once you enter the CLI, you've gone through the looking glass and you never come back. Right? I can never re Linuxize my box once I've gone into that. Or I start in CLI land, and as soon as I go into Linux land, the door closes behind me. Mm. We don't want to do that. Right? We, want, again, want to use this as a simple building block. So when I come into NCLU and I type net add, BGP autonomous system number. What that actually does is writes into the configuration for free range routing. And when I do net add interface port 1, 10, 1, 1, 1, that writes into the Linux Etsy network interfaces file. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah, that mm -hmm. at least somebody is still thinking at the non-developer. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you. And so, what's important about that is that I, as a network engineer, can come through, use the CLI, get tab completion, get in-device help with net help, and see documentation of how to configure something, including like MLAG where it's multiple boxes. I can configure it. I can walk away. My sysadmin, who's on call that night, can then look at the Etsy network interfaces file and know exactly what I did. And this also is really important because I think every single vendor you've talked to this week has been, hey, check out our box and check out this application you can run on it. Well, the problem that you always end up seeing with these, I mean, the, the, the oldest story there is just automation, is that, hey, I can run Puppet. You can't use anything Puppet's ever done before or Ansible's ever done before, but we built like three things and you can use those three things with that application. But because we're not changing the model, I can come in with something like Ansible, or I can use Sensu for monitoring, or I can use Telegraph on box for streaming telemetry. And then I can come in as an operator when things don't work, and I can use my CLI and have that shared language, which is still Linux. How I interface with Linux is up to me. And again, it's about those simple building blocks being able to be stacked on top of each other to make a more complex system that does what you need it to do. So any questions about that? So overall, you know, what, we're, what we look at is, is Linux is kind of the model that everybody's rallying around. It's the way forward. And everything that we do that deviates from Linux is a problem. And so what that means is that before we can get down to the switch ASIC, we have to make sure it works in the software. And we look at the software as the model for how we do everything. So a lot of platforms, other vendors, other, other products, when you do a configuration, some of that stuff starts in software and gets pushed to the ASIC. Some of that ends up sideloading and coming straight to the ASIC and totally skipping over that software component. So because we have a simple building block of Linux, I can take this whole component, and I can remove just my software piece and run it in what's called Cumulus VX, virtual experience. So it's not a vRouter, it's not a vSwitch, it's just a VM of our software model. And it looks exactly like the switch it runs on top of. And again, because we're putting everything here first, everything that works on this Mellanox switch works on my software. So I can configure VLANs and VXLANs and ACLs and do EVPN, EVPN bridging, EVPN routing, symmetric mode, asymmetric mode. I can do it all in a free VM. And that free VM, again, instead of trying to do something different or trying to say like, well, you have to run OpenStack to stand up two nodes, we once again wanted to take simple building blocks. So Cumulus VX, can run in VMware, VirtualBox, or KVM. 
So again, we're taking simple, well understood constructs of these VMs and building more complex things. And now, since I have a Linux device, a Linux operating system, running on a virtual machine that has lots of Linux operating systems on it, I can now add in a tool like Vagrant, which allows me to describe the connectivity of devices and stand these things up. And so what I can do here is I can take tens, hundreds of nodes. I was working on a, on a lab just last week with, uh, I think, 187 devices in that virtual topology. What I'm going to show you today is a little bit smaller than that, but still sizable. And what that means is I can take the exact one-to-one -one replica of my data center with the exact one-to-one -one features in my data center, with the exact one-to-one -one configurations in my data center, and I can start modeling, configuring, predicting, testing, validating, training, learning with them. And I can use this tool Vagrant, and I'm not here to teach you Vagrant today, but just to let you know, and do something like Vagrant up and launch those 200 devices. Come back a few minutes later and it works. And we don't have to build anything for Vagrant. We don't really have to build anything on top of this. One of the other things that's also amazing is KVM, at its base as a hypervisor, allows you to do tunnels between bare metal servers running VMs. So I can have a VM on server one and a VM on server two, and using a UDP tunnel, they look like they're attached together within the hypervisor. So running 200 devices sounds great if I've got the hardware for it. So again, I want to take this simple building block and scale it out and build a more complex system. So I could take two or three or four servers and spread those 100, 200, 300 switches across them and virtualize whatever it is that I want to build. And again, it's about those simple building blocks that continue to scale out, whether it's a spinal leaf architecture, whether it's a Linux <coughs> model, whether it's a VM, or whether it's virtualization. And that's really kind of how we see the world. And then once we have that viewpoint, we can do anything from there. So Pete, I'm sorry if you've already mentioned yeah. this, but uh, the Cumulus VX is just for <coughs> testing, just for, it's not, it's not gonna replace like a V router. Or anything. Not a V router, so we've done uh, approximately zero work for packet acceleration. So you can ping, you can trace route, you can send data, you can run iperf on it if you want, but we haven't done like a dbdk layer, we're not doing like an fd.io layer. Um, it might work, but we don't care about the <coughs> It's like a validation platform. Right? It's a validation platform. Okay. And I, and I will tell you that even, you know, customers that work with our consulting services, what we actually do with every single one of those customers is we build their entire data center in Cumulus VX. We build all the automation in Cumulus VX while we're waiting for that gear to show up and that whatever that lead time is. And then once the gear is there, we plug it all in and just drop the exact same configuration and everything on there and it's ready to go. All your code's ready to go. And it's a pretty powerful statement. Vendor work? <laughs> yeah, so, so Cumulus, Cumulus VX is yeah, just the VM. The same model. So there's no hardware component. I'm sorry, not just, not just VX, but like, if oh, it wasn't, for, can it I wasn't use... a Mellanox switch, could it be some other white box? So we run on uh, roughly 70 different switches today from, I think, I'm going to get this number wrong. Uh, I want to say eight different manufacturers. Uh, because we are the bare metal, or are we the operating system for that bare metal, we have to know how to do things like what is the, the order of shaking the plus 5 volt and minus 5 volt lines on the CPU to indicate that the switch is being turned on. And so we have to write those device drivers and understand that model. So we can't run on just everything. Um, you know, you can't go buy like a Netgear, figure out how to how to like crack it and install Cumulus on it. Um, we do have to be able to write to that platform to be able to understand it, just like any other operating system. Thanks. So any other questions? All right. So now I'm going to show you some demo stuff, and if we're real lucky. It'll even work. <laughs> Invoke the demo gods. Yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to show you is built entirely in Cumulus VX. Uh, it's all on GitHub. Uh, GitHub.com slash Plumbus slash NFT17. Um,
it's the pointing at it that makes it work. <laughs> so I have a topology that looks kind of like this. So again, I'm mixing, but I'm using those same, those simple building blocks. I have 32 leaves. I have four spines. I'm running EBGP in this fabric. And I've attached six Ubuntu hosts in my scenario. Two of these hosts are using VXLAN between them. And the other four are part of a Docker Swarm cluster. So as I said, we believe in these simple building blocks. And we believe in building blocks based on Linux. So what we've done is we've created an application called NetQ. NetQ is an agent that lives directly on my switch, and it listens to Linux Netlink messages, as well as a few other things. And so there's a lot of vendors that talk about pub sub models and things like that. Linux was the original pub sub model. So I can write an application that listens to messages within that kernel, and then just pick them up as they happen in real time. And that's exactly what, Netlink, what NetQ does. I'm listening to things like routes, MAC addresses, IP addresses, LLDP neighbors, fans, sensors, interface counters, you name it. And I can run this on any device that runs Linux. So it's supported on both Cumulus Linux, Ubuntu, Debian, and Red Hat. And now that I have all of this data about my environment, I can start to ask it questions. And so I can ask questions like, if I'm anywhere in my environment, is BGP working as I expect it? And NetQ will look at all those devices and all that information, and it'll say, you know, I looked at those 260 se 60 device or sessions across your 42 nodes, and everything is working. I can pull data or information from any device from any device. So you'll notice I'm on leaf 30. I'm going to cheat here. And I'm going to look at host 02. I can see it's an Ubuntu box running 16.04. Who is host02 connected to? I see that it's connected to Leaf2 on Ethernet 1. What are its IP neighbors? What are its ARP entries? I see an ARP entry here for 10.1.2.11. All of this is about host02, even though I'm somewhere else in the network. Because if we think about our flow as Network administrators, what we end up doing is logging to one device, running the show MAC address table, logging to the next device. If we're advanced, we're using Tmux. You know, if you're if you're elite, if you're less elite, <laughs> you've got like 30 tabs open. <laughs> or if you're like me, you just get like a really tiny resolution and open like 400 putty windows. <laughs> On a Mac. On a Mac. <laughs> I actually just hate myself so much that I start a Windows VM yeah. and then run Putty in the Windows VM I believe, just to punish myself. I believe you would do that. <laughs> I really do. So I can look at a MAC address for a neighbor, right? And I see that this ties to the 10.1.2.11 host, this 44 ending in 39. And I can even say, who, who owns that? Maybe I don't know the device it's connected to. And so I can say, NetQ, who owns that MAC address? Where do you see it in the environment? And NetQ tells me, well, I see that MAC address in VLAN 12 on Leaf 2 and on Leaf 1. Leaf 2 learned it through a VNI. Leaf 1 learned it from host 1. And we can do things like, well, what would you do if you received that MAC address? You received a frame destined for it. So I can do a trace route for L2 or L3 for that MAC address from any point in the network. So again, I'm on leaf 30. Leaf 2, what would you do if you got that MAC address? Leaf 2 is going to look at that information, and it's going to say, well, it's over a VXLAN tunnel, so I'm going to encapsulate it into VNI 12. I can then ECMP out my four links, swaps 1, 2, 3, and 4. We call our front panel ports SWP, or switch ports. That'll land on spine 1, 2, 3, or 4, port 1. That'll egress to Leaf 01 ZNI, and you know what? All of those will end up on Host 01. But this is great. Everything's working. What if I break things? Like the size of my terminal window. So I wrote uh, using NetQ. We're going to go a little bit more into what I can ask NetQ and how do I access that information. 
but I used NetQ to build a chaos monkey. So if you're familiar with Netflix, they have this thing called Chaos Monkey and uh, what they call the Simeon Army, which is a collection of tools that goes in and breaks things randomly to make sure that it's resilient. You know, as network engineers, that is our job. I put two devices in in parallel or install two supervisors because I hate money and want redundancy. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of reasons we do things, but we're all about that resiliency. And then much like a backup solution, we never test it. And so Netflix had this idea of chaos engineering where, no, 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 we are definitely going to test it. We're going to go in and break things. And for us, the challenge with breaking things is, one, organizational, but two, it's hard to do, right? I mean, we are, we are kind of in the, still the infancy of automation where we're still crawling to push configurations. How do I automate or randomize chaos in my network besides higher interns? <laughs> so I can use NetQ to pull the, all of the devices in the network, figure out the services they're running, and then break some of them. And I call it the Chaos Tamarin. Uh, a Tamarin is a tiny little monkey that weighs like one or two pounds, because I have a little Chaos Monkey. <laughs> and so I'm going to break BGP on three devices. And so it's going to find all the devices running BGP in the environment using NetQ. It's then going to log into those devices using SSH, not using NetQ, and it's going to shut BGP off on them. And so now I have these three broken devices. That's great. I put a print statement in there so I can see that. But what if it was my actual production network? Well, I can see exactly what happened. I can see I have six sessions down because I broke three, and the remote three sides are going to break as well. And so I think this really just kind of shows, one, the ability to look at NetQ, but two, what is it showing off? What is it? What can I see with it? You know, going, going beyond this, something that's cool is NetQ is built on, again, simple tools. So instead of building something brand new and unique and different and interesting, we built something known and unique and interesting. So we took the Redis key value store, a distributed database application. That's part of what NetQ is. So every switch in my network is now part of this distributed database. And they're pushing their data into that database. So if it's just a database, can I ask it questions? You uh -huh. absolutely can. So we can do things like, well, what are the tables in that database? So when I run NetQ check BGP, I'm actually querying the database, pulling data, and then we're providing some intelligence to actually process what comes back from that, that SQL query, if we will. But I could build my own queries. So we give you the things that we think everybody cares about, but you can build the things that you care about. So let's say I want to look at all the devices in my network, and I want to sort them by uptime. So I can run a query where I'm going to select the host name and the sysuptime from the nodes table and sort it by sysuptime. And you can see that four hours ago, which was, you know, for a really fun adventure after this, you can look at my commit history to see the panicked building of this immediately before we got started. Like the, it's, the, it's the duck mode where it's really calm on the surface and they're just kicking really hard underneath the water. <laughs> but I can, this is great, I can look at uptime, whatever, but what if I want to do something like see how long it takes a route to get through my environment? So let's, uh, let's look at a loopback address on this device the 10.0.0.30 IP. I'm going to shut down that loopback interface and make it get withdrawn. Wait just a second. Bring it back up. So I just create a route flap. And I want to see how long it takes for that environment to propagate that route flap and reprogram. So let's look at. I'm going to query from the routing table where the prefix matches what I'm looking for and sort it by time. Because everything that we record, we throw a timestamp on it. So I can see 17 seconds ago it showed up on leaf 30, because that's where it started. 12 seconds ago, spine 1 got it. 
those are my immediate four peers. They're going to be the first ones to receive that route. <coughs> After that, I'm going to propagate to the rest of my network. So I can see that 12.7 seconds ago, my whole network converged for that prefix based on those queries. One of the other things I can do is because I have timestamps on this, well, let's go back in time. So again, let me look at this trace route for VXLAN that we looked at earlier. So from leaf two, everything's great, everything works. So just to check, when you run the trace route, it's, it's not actually sending anything, right? It is, it is analyzing the control plane state of the path. Right, no okay, that's, that's what I thought. So it's, it's theorizing what would happen based on the state that it knows. That's exactly right. Okay. So I shut down one of the uplinks. I'll run the exact same trace command. Now I only have three paths. That's expected, but this looks good. NetQ doesn't know if this is broken or not. So what did it look like? Hmm. So you know that issue where they're like, hey, yesterday at 4 o'clock it didn't work, but then everything was fine by 4.05, why? And you go, you know, syslogs or GTFO, <laughs> and then they never have logs. Well, now I can look back in time, and I can say, huh, that's weird. Something changed. How long does it store that data for? Based on the memory of the server. So we have a server called the telemetry server mm -hmm. all, that's sucking all this up and running the queries. It's only based on memory and disk of that telemetry server. Okay, so it, it forever. It uses what you give it. Yep. Yep. You so that infinite? Via an API <laughs> I can't believe you didn't say it's infinite. It's infinite. Until the hardware runs out. Until the well, we're runs using out. we're Until using an advanced out. blockchain technology. <laughs> <laughs> Did I get bingo? Finally, <laughs> cumulus share price up twenty five percent this afternoon. No one knows why. <laughs> Sorry, I think we just got acquired. I think that. Was... <laughs> and it's back down again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you asked, is it queryable via an API? Yes. Uh, so. Today, not directly, meaning that it's just Redis. So you could query it through a Redis API, um, but you can query it through the NetQ agent API. There is no external, there's no like RESTful API on top of it today. Sorry, did you say that all of this is running on a separate telemetry server? It is, the or agent is runs on every device. Right. That <coughs> agent is part of a cluster, which is all the agents plus another VM running uh, running that thing. So it's okay, not an it's appliance. That, it's that other VM I was checking yep. about. Okay, good. Just make sure I understood. And so I can look back in time and say, well, what changed in the last five minutes on that leaf? And it tells me, well, you lost a BGP peer one minute ago. I saw an MTU change because it went down. You lost some IPv6 routes. And a whole bunch of routing changed as a result of ECMP changing. So again, I can go back in time and see exactly what happened. And I can even take this tool and provide it to my systems administrator and say, don't call me. And let them query this. And they can run this agent on their devices and see those things. And I've shown some network focused things, but we've also added integration for Docker. Wait, so NetQ is an agent that you could run on any Linux system. It doesn't have to be a networking node at all. That's exactly it right. It will query this database and yep. tell you the state of your network. Yeah, so if I look at... Like, you just blew past that one, Pete. Like, you, you, gotta, <laughs> you gotta give us a minute to absorb this stuff. That's on me. That's on yeah, me. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> busy blockchain. The spankings will come in. <laughs> so if I look at this device, it's an Ubuntu server called Host01. NetQ uh, host01 show IP addresses. Right, so I can look at the information from that host. All of the hosts in this environment are Linux devices. So this one's running Docker. So I have some Docker interfaces tied to it that I can see. And then there's a bunch of other fields that I can query about those hosts. But we're listening to Docker Swarm. So I can start to do things like show me the summary. So I can see the nodes that are part of that Docker swarm 
I can see how many networks, what they're, how many containers they're running, things like that. If I look for the services, the only container service I see in my environment is this thing called Apache Web. And I see that it's running on four devices. Well, which devices is it running on? What's their connectivity in the network? And I can see it's running on hosts three, four, five, and six who connect up to Leafs three, four, five, and six. So I'm starting to blur that line between the network and that container land. And as network engineers, we absolutely know what's going to happen is these super ephemeral containers are going to pop up and down and get <laughs> shot like you know rats in a basement. And they're going to go, why did the network break it? And you're going to go, I, it didn't. That's what, you're, what the container thing does. It's <laughs> <laughs> a feature of containers. So I can even say, well, what containers are adjacent to the interface of a device? So I'll look on leaf 5. Show me the containers that are adjacent on port 5. And it'll say, well, on port 5, I've got Apache Web and Cumulus Row. So all of these devices running Docker are also running routing on the host, BGP peering directly with my top of rack switch. So is it BGP? Tab completion for everything. Uh, I'm not running BGP there, but uh, our net queue on that one. If I look on the leaf it's attached to, I actually see that I have a BGP peer to that top of rack switch. So let's look at things like impact. So what would happen if I needed to do a software upgrade on leaf 05? I have to take it out of service. I don't know what's running underneath of that. They're the container servers. Well, I can actually see that it's part of this Apache web cluster, and there's three other replicas in here, but you're going to kill one of them. It's single homed. It lost its dual uplink. It was single homed from the beginning, whatever that is. I, as a network engineer, now know exactly what I'm going to break and who's going to call me. And just like everything else, I'm going to record the changes. So if I jump on a device, and let's say spin up a simple container called Hello World, which is already running there, so I can't do that. So I'm going to spin up this new container. Right? It doesn't matter what it does, but I'm going to start a container. It's going to live for one second, print Hello World, and then die. Well, I can see that, again, from NetQueue. And I look back in time, and I say, well, you flap the, the routing on the host container a couple of times, you stood up this Apache web thing, and then you just launched and deleted the Hello World application. And so again, I start to get this visibility into what happened. And so again, when I get that phone call that says, hey, why did you break my container environment? You go, what are you talking about, man? Your, your, your containers just turn themselves off. That's not on me. <laughs> not the network's fault. So I'm going to ask a stupid question. No stupid uh, question. Is this the NetQ? Is that the NCLU piece? You're not having to go into another uh, CLI and then back into Linux? NetQ has its own CLI, but it's actually built, again, on those same common building blocks. So Net NCLU. So I can do an IP link show and get this Linux -y output. Or I can do a net show interfaces with tab completion and get something that looks significantly less awful. So that's a CLI application running on it on Linux. And NetQ's CLI is actually that same CLI library. Okay. So it is a separate application, but it's importing its own NCLU. Uh, one of the things I think is really cool. Uh, was it Net? So Net Help told me that what I'm actually looking for is Net Example. You know what I mean? Like, you're not having to go into a, a different CLI to do certain things and then back. That's to right. It all, it all happens from, yeah. from the, the bash prompt, gives me that tab completion in those. And NCLU itself has built in help. So I can say, well, if I wanted to build OSPF unnumbered between these two devices called Spino 01 and Leaf 01, given this information, these are the set of commands that it would run. And this is how I would verify it. 
we look at something more complicated. Because you're not even going into a CLI, you're invoking a CLI from the bash prompt. Exactly. It's, the CLI is just an application that's running on top of Linux that provides a different interface into all the same information, right? That's exactly right. Um, we've also been uh, seeing a lot of things like orchestration and whatnot mm -hmm. this week. Um, are you involved in any of that stuff as well from an yeah. outside of the CLI kind of perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So what we've done for orchestration is doing absolutely nothing but being Linux and having every Linux tool on the, on the planet work with us. So I'll give you that exact that con a concrete example. <laughs> You're doing it so again. it's not it's not a, it's not a package box <laughs> orchestration tool that we've been looking at. That is correct. So it does rely in this case on a little bit of of, of skill, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Right. You know, just kind of piggybacking off of riches. What, what it requires in skill, it makes up for in extreme flexibility, flex and flexibility compatibility, yeah. absolutely robustness, S robustness, yeah, very good. So, Very good of robustness. Well, this is. so I'll just use Ansible. I, I used Ansible to build this whole environment. <coughs> and earlier, just to be I, fair, Peak, if I could throw it out there, Ansible has a very low starting kind of barrier. Yeah, exactly. You can go very, very quickly. It's yeah. not a, a, a difficult thing. So yeah. it's not like well, it's for, a for Linux like boxes. Boxes. <laughs> Yes, which is perfect for this. And that's the thing. What's beautiful is because <laughs> it's all virtual, yeah. I can build a virtual lab. I can then use Ansible running virtually. And then when I break everything, I can just kill it and restart it. The whole VM, the whole lab, whatever. You know, so I can do something like run an Ansible playbook that's invoking standard Ansible libraries, not the Cumulus ones, but the off-the-shelf Linux ones that are being run on tens or hundreds of thousands of Linux devices every day, and reprovision and fix my environment. And if I can take that thread like just a little bit further, one of the other things I think we've heard from another number of folks is um, this idea of kind of becoming the platform. And what I think I hear you saying is that that platform is already here. It's Linux. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but then, so then taking that step further is. If you're going to be running, you know, in, in an enterprise, and you may have folks who are admins or operators versus architects or engineers, maybe there's more setup involved here, right? So, so the, the tooling, the fancy tooling we were just referring to, makes it a lot easier to operate. Mm -hmm. But you could set all that up ahead of time, so maybe there's just like there's maybe a little bit higher bar to entry. Um, did you? I mean, do you, I, I agree 100. You, you know, there's there a there's a, there's a great there. there's a great XKCD comic. Uh, talking about like building a script versus time, right? Mm -hmm. And so as a network engineer, your time is effectively literally growing forever on the amount of work you have to do. So you do this stuff, you have a really high barrier to entry for that first day, and then you just like go home at 11.30 in the morning every day for the rest of your career. <laughs> and so there is that setup piece. But again, this is why you know we haven't taken a dogmatic approach. We built a CLI. We support TACAX. You know, we... We, we still do L2, even though we look at L3 as the world. So we have, we say, look, this is the way enterprises should do it. Here's the place you can start with what you have today. And, you know, let's help you get there on that journey. 